Hi everybody, this is Chris Morosky, and this is a short video on hypertension in pregnancy. I'd like to thank Dr. Deborah Feldman for her contributions to this video. The objectives of this video are to describe the physiologic changes that occur in the cardiovascular system during pregnancy, to understand and differentiate the various types of hypertensive disorders during pregnancy, and to describe some of the pathophysiologic changes that occur in preeclampsia. As an introduction, hypertension is the most common medical complication in pregnancy, and it is a major cause of maternal and neonatal morbidity and mortality. There are three forms of hypertension seen in pregnancy, and these are preeclampsia, gestational hypertension, and chronic essential hypertension. As far as the cardiovascular system is concerned during pregnancy, there is a progressive decline in arterial blood pressure in the first 24 weeks of pregnancy. The systolic blood pressure drops approximately 5 to 10 millimeters mercury, and the diastolic blood pressure drops 10 to 15 millimeters mercury. This is all largely due to decreased peripheral vascular resistance, and this is from the progesterone-mediated smooth muscle relaxation and from vasodilation. Arterial blood pressure slowly increases after 24 weeks to the non-pregnant levels by term. Usually this does not go above the baseline blood pressure, even at the end of pregnancy. In pregnancy, the position of the patient has a large effect on the blood pressure values. In terms of the cardiovascular system during labor, there is an increase in cardiac output in labor, and this is likely secondary to pain and apprehension. Each contraction squeezes 300 to 500 cc's of blood from the uterus into the circulation. Delivery itself is associated with an auto-transfusion of blood back into the circulation after delivering the baby in the placenta. There are three major types of hypertension in pregnancy. Again, preeclampsia, chronic essential hypertension, and gestational hypertension. We will approach these three in that order. Preeclampsia is unique to pregnancy, and it is really a disease of the placenta. This seems to only affect humans, and the incidence is that it affects 6 to 8% of pregnancies. It is the second most common cause of maternal death in the United States. The diagnosis of preeclampsia is made by documenting hypertension of greater than 140 over 90 on two values six hours apart, and also new onset proteinuria with over 300 milligrams of protein in a 24-hour urine collection. The predisposing pathogenic mechanisms of preeclampsia are not well understood, but they probably incorporate genetic imprinting, immune maladaptation, oxidative stress, placental ischemia, generalized endothelial dysfunction, and defective placental free fatty acid and lipid metabolism. In a normal pregnancy, the utero-placental unit is low resistance, low pressure, and a high flow system. In preeclampsia, what is seen is that there is a decreased number of arterioles, an abnormal vasculature, and this all causes a high resistance, low flow, and high pressure. Part of the pathophysiology is felt to be that there is a complete or partial failure of trophoblastic invasion. In normal pregnancy, the trophoblast invasion is responsible for destruction of the muscularis layer of the spiral arteries. This allows for utero-placental circulation. In preeclampsia, there is delayed remodeling of maternal spiral arteries by the extravillous trophoblast. This abnormal placentation causes the spiral arteries to retain a thick muscularis. They are unable to dilate normally, and this leads to placental dysfunction. And this, in turn, causes the release of factors which affect the whole circulatory system. The angiogenic balance is crucial for normal differentiation in invasion of extravillous trophoblasts. Abnormal placentation leads to hypoxia, and this hypoxia may result in higher SFLT1 production. This, in turn, leads to a relative deficiency of vascular endothelial growth factor. Soluble FMS tyrosine kinase 1, or SFLT1, acts by antagonizing vascular endothelial growth factor and placental growth factor. Decreased VGF also decreases prostacyclin, which is a potent antithrombotic factor. There is present abnormalities in angiogenic balance, and this can lead to the hypertension, proteinuria, endothelial dysfunction, and hypercoagulability of preeclampsia. In preeclampsia, endothelial cell changes are seen. An intact endothelium protects against thrombus formation. With vascular injury, this initiates the intrinsic and extrinsic coagulation pathways. The endothelium influences response of the vessels to vasoactive agents, and this all leads to increased vasospasm. Other important factors in preeclampsia revolve around nitric oxide, which is normally a 
potent vasodilator produced by the endothelium. Its production is reduced with the injured endothelium. Also, elevated levels of soluble endoglin antagonize TGF-beta, which decreases endothelial nitric oxide production. There are also lipid peroxidases, free radicals, and antioxidants, which all play a role in the pathophysiology of preeclampsia. The risk factors for preeclampsia include nulliparous women, extremes of age, both teenagers and advanced maternal age, a family history of preeclampsia, multiple gestations, obesity, previous preeclampsia, a poor outcome in a previous pregnancy, and certain medical conditions including diabetes, renal disease, and chronic hypertension, and also hereditary and acquired thrombophilias are risk factors for preeclampsia. It is important to note that preeclampsia is a multi-system disorder with hematologic, renal, hepatic, neurologic, pulmonary, fetal, and placental units all being involved. The hematologic effects in preeclampsia are hemoconcentration, thrombocytopenia, hemolysis, increased thrombin levels, decreased antithrombin levels, and there can be disseminated intravascular coagulopathy seen. The renal effects include vasospasm, and glomerular endotheliosis also causes a decrease in GFR. The decreased renal function shows a reduction in GFR by 25%, and there's also elevated uric acid, but rarely an increase in BUN or creatinine until things are severe. Oliguria is also uncommon, but can occur in severe preeclampsia. There are hepatic effects noted in approximately 10% of patients with severe preeclampsia. This shows up as elevated transaminases, and there can be a fibrogen deposition in the hepatic sinusoids. Rarely can you see a subcapsular hematoma. Neurologic effects include cerebral edema, retinal detachment, and eclampsia. Pulmonary effects are pulmonary edema and pleural effusions. The fetus can also be affected. In preeclampsia, it is not uncommon to see growth restriction, hypoxia, oligohydramnios, placental abruption, and occasionally fetal death. The diagnosis of preeclampsia with severe features includes a blood pressure greater than 160 over 110, a serum creatinine greater than 1.1 mg per deciliter, thrombocytopenia with a platelet count less than 100,000, elevated liver enzymes, pulmonary edema, and new onset cerebral or visual changes. A separate but related condition is something called HELP syndrome. In HELP syndrome, there is hemolysis, which manifests by an abnormal peripheral smear and increased bilirubin levels, elevated liver enzymes, where the liver enzymes are elevated twice the upper limit of normal values, and low platelets, with a platelet count less than 100,000. In the differential diagnosis of HELP syndrome are many conditions that must be ruled out before making the diagnosis of HELP syndrome. The management of preeclampsia overall is delivery of the baby and the placenta. Delivery is always appropriate therapy for the mother, but may not be so for the fetus, especially if the baby is preterm. It is important to weigh the benefits and risks of delivery based on the severity of the preeclampsia and the gestational age for the baby. For severe disease at term, the mother is induced for delivery. She is then given magnesium sulfate for seizure prophylaxis to prevent eclamptic seizures. For severe disease remote from term, the patient is given magnesium sulfate and beta-methasone steroids to help mature the baby's lungs and other organs. She is placed on bed rest and is often observed for some period of time in the hospital. The eventual plan is to deliver her after she's completed the steroids or she remains on close observation in the hospital. There have been many tests that have been designed to try to predict preeclampsia, but for the most part, all have failed. More than 100 tests have been studied to predict these patients at high risk for preeclampsia, including a high mean arterial pressure, a rollover test at 28 to 32 weeks, an angiotensin infusion test at 26 to 30 weeks, measuring uterine and umbilical artery dopplers at 18 to 26 weeks, and measuring maternal SFLT1 levels in the serum and urine. Again, none of these have been found to be beneficial. Preeclampsia prevention has recently gotten interesting. Previously, none of these medications, low-dose aspirin, vitamin E, vitamin C, magnesium, or calcium were shown to have any effect in prevention of preeclampsia. However, there is new research to suggest that for women at risk for preeclampsia, low-dose aspirin may be beneficial in preventing subsequent preeclampsia in a pregnancy. Chronic hypertension is hypertension identified before 20 weeks gestational age, and this includes a blood pressure greater than 140 over 90, and this also can be diagnosed with hypertension that persists for more than six weeks postpartum. 
There is increased risk with hypertension during pregnancy. There's a risk of developing superimposed preeclampsia, which is preeclampsia on top of chronic hypertension. Chronic hypertension by itself can cause poor fetal growth, and there is an overall increased perinatal morbidity and mortality, especially with superimposed preeclampsia. Many antihypertensive medications can be used during pregnancy. This includes Aldamet, which is alpha methadopa, beta blockers, hydralazine, calcium channel blockers, and diuretics. However, it's important to avoid ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, as these can be teratogenic. There is debate on when to treat hypertensive patients during pregnancy. For patients with a mild chronic hypertension, where the systolic blood pressure is less than 140 to 150 and the diastolic is less than 100, there is no evidence that treatment alters the pregnancy outcomes or improves prognosis. The management of patients with chronic hypertension includes obtaining a baseline 24-hour urine collection for baseline protein and baseline preeclamptic labs. Patients are then watched closely for superimposed preeclampsia. The fetal surveillance includes monthly growth scans to ensure that the baby is growing normally, as well as regular non-stress testing as term approaches in the pregnancy. And most patients are recommended to undergo an induction of labor if they remain undelivered by 37 to 39 weeks. Gestational hypertension is the most common form of hypertension in pregnancy. It itself is a diagnosis of exclusion. The onset has to occur after 20 weeks, or this is called chronic hypertension. In this setting, there is elevated blood pressures, but there is no proteinuria. There are also no other signs or symptoms of preeclampsia. These patients are observed closely. The outcomes are likely no worse than that for chronic essential hypertension. And again, these patients are recommended to undergo induction of labor by 37 to 39 weeks. Well, that's about it, everybody. I think we were able to cover our objectives of describing the physiologic changes that occur in the cardiovascular system during pregnancy, to understand and differentiate the various types of hypertensive disorders during pregnancy, and to describe some of the pathophysiologic changes that occur in preeclampsia. I hope that you found this video helpful. Good luck with your studies, and we'll be seeing you soon in class. Take care. Mm -hmm.